Thank you very much. So as Tara said, the title of my talk, and as you can read, is The Face of Bacillus Subtilis, Genomes and Biofilms. So I've been s focused on this bacterial species called Bacillus subtilis since I started my postdoc. And I'm looking at it, uh, this group, at a both a genotypic perspective, so looking all the way down to the genome level, as well as from a phenotypic perspective, looking specifically at biofilms. And I just heard this morning, I didn't know Rich had come to and spoken to you already, so you're, <laughs> you're going to see some familiar slides, I think, which is great. So perhaps my introduction to biofilms will go much smoother. So to really begin, I thought I would step back and, and do a little history lesson and vis revisit sort of our old world view of biodiversity on the planet. And so this is Whitaker's take back in about 1970 or so. And as you can see, Whitaker saw the world of uh, the, the biodiversity in our world in five different kingdoms where the plants the fungus and the animals largely predominated. And underneath that, we had this small group of protists and the very lowly bottom, making up a very small fraction of the total, were the group containing what we consider bacteria. Well, this isn't true. Even though I was even taught this in college in early mid-90s, hopefully these aren't in the textbooks any longer, because as it turns out, if we were to really uh, redraw this tree to represent how many true diverse groups are within each one of these kingdoms, what we would see is that this group, Monera, would be orders of magnitude larger than all three of these kingdoms combined. So why the switch? Well, to understand the switch, I think we need to understand why Whitaker had this view. And not just Whitaker, I'm kind of picking on him, but that's not fair. We, most people uh, can, grouped organisms, considered species, based on whether or not they could successfully reproduce, they had, had successful offspring, but also just based on how they looked, morphological characteristics. And so if we take um, a very famous example of Darwin's finches here, um, when we look at these birds, we can see that they have very characteristic beak sizes and shapes, among other features. And based on that, we can begin to infer something about the relationship among these different organisms. And so then we can build these relationship trees, where in this case, we would say that finch one and finch two were more likely to share a common ancestor than they were to either finch three or finch four. All right, great. So that worked for finches, that worked for macroorganisms, but it doesn't work for microbes. And why is that? Well, the big duh is that they're really hard to see first off. So it's not like a finch sitting on a bush somewhere. And in fact, they're not only hard to see, but they are amazingly abundant. In fact, here's a, I call it microbe fun fact. Uh, there are more microbes in one gram of soil, so one scoop of soil, if you will, than there are humans on the earth today. That's 10 billion organisms. So that's quite a challenge. And in addition to that, even if you can see them, they don't really have beaks, right? There's nothing really striking when you look under a microscope at two different bacteria. Now, there are some variations in the sizes and the shapes of the microbes, but in general, I'd say you'd, anyone would be hard pressed to distinguish these two organisms robustly. And I'll tell you this, this organism and this organism are about as closely related as we are to something like trees or something ridiculous like that. So it really goes to show we couldn't rely on just strictly looking at the morphology to, to do this. Now, that's not to say that even in Whitaker's day that we didn't know Bacillus anthracis uh, wasn't Brady rhizobium. There were tests, carbon utilization, respiration, et cetera, that would tell us that. But I think you get the point. Why were we so woefully underestimating diversity in the bacteria? Well, it's because they were a challenge to group. But it changed, right? So we know that it changed, but why? Well, that's when a clever man named Carl Woese stepped into the picture, and he happened to be thinking about these things when certain technologies came on board. And he decided that instead of focusing on morphologies, he would focus on the genotypes, genes. And he chose, as his first pursuit, this gene called 16S, ribosomal RNA. It's 18S in eukaryotes. And, six, and so this allowed one to not only look at the diversity among microorganisms, but you could actually look at the relationship among all living things. And so 16S ribosomal RNA is an essential component of the ribosome. And of course, the ribosome is important for translation of your proteins, and without proteins, there is no life. And so it's thought that 16S is uh, an 18S, or derived from a shared common ancestor of all extant life. And because of its really basic and essential function, it cannot change very much, which is great. So I'm showing you an alignment of these particular genes from humans to yeast to corn to E. coli 
to a number of other bacteria and even archaea. And as you can see in these shaded regions, you have very, very high homology, which is super, because we can use that to our advantage and design primers to do PCR, so we can sequence these genes, because it turns out, in addition to these very highly conserved regions, there are also these regions of genetic flexibility. And we can use the changes in these flexible regions to begin to predict or, or estimate how long it's been since two organisms shared a common ancestor. So essentially we can use 16S or 18S ribosome RNA as a sort of evolutionary clock, quantitatively inferring relationships. So that was the big change. And when people started to apply this to their favorite or group of organisms, what they found was that the tree of life really did get a good shakeup. And, and that couldn't be more the case than for the microbes. So we went from a, a sort of tree of life that looked something like this to one that looked something like this. Now it's a little bit different, but instead of five kingdoms, we're now thinking of the tree of life as being uh, part of three different domains. We have the eukarya, the bacteria, and the archaea. And just to orient you, in the eukarya, these three little pieces here at this one tip contain all of the plants, all of the animals, and all of the fungi combined. Big difference. And and now you've got these two very large domains that are made up completely of unicellular, non-nucleus containing microbes. So when I look at this and when I think about this, it makes me quite excited to be part of microbiology because not only do we have so much going on here today, this keeps changing. These two branches of the tree change. It seems like every new niche that we go into and we start querying who's there, what, who are they related to? We keep finding more and more deeply rooted branches in this tree. Eukarya is pretty stable. They find new species, but usually they already belong to some, a phylum that's already present. So it's pretty exciting to me. And while I think that these deeply rooted branches and these new things coming along are really excited, my focus really lies at diversity at sort of a, I don't know how to, a higher resolution, if you will. So what does that mean? So if we take, uh, let's see if I can transition here. If we take one of these domains, this bacterial domain, and we turn it on its side. So here's a picture that I stole from someone's paper, basically showing the same thing. And we look at this phylum, or division, some people call them divisions. This phylum is conta uh, contains groups within groups within groups of bacteria. And so this is our taxonomic scheme. And in order to go to the next successive group, you have to be more and more closely related to that other guy in your group, right? So how does that work? So we'll just go through it. So if you have uh, a phylum called Firmicutes, for instance, we would see that it's made up of three different classes. And we have a class called Bacilli, made up of two orders, this order Bacillales. You've got a number of families, one family called Bacillacea. You've got the number of genera. And this one genus called Bacillus has currently 90, about 90 recognized species. And this is where I get into the fray. I'm interested at the very tip of this tree, the very tip of this phylum, and the species called Bacillus subtilis. And we normally think species are sort of like the, the end point of where we go in terms of taxonomy. And what got me really excited was, you know, we think about a species, we think about, especially for bacteria, pretty homogeneous, okay, yeah, you know, things aren't gonna differ too much, but this is what I saw when I started to look at, at the face of Bacillus subtilis. And so this, apparently you've already seen, um, and so basically what this is, no, it's beautiful. are you serious? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Like Rich didn't of upstage me. Yeah. What's that? She like one of them. Okay, good, good. I thought this was gonna be like the, uh, duh, we've already seen it. <laughs> but what this is, and yeah, so I'm glad, that's a nice response. That's like the best response I've ever had. <laughs> so uh, what this is, is a different Bacillus subtilis isolates taken from all over the world that I've, ta I've spotted onto one medium in our laboratory. And this is robust, so you can spot this over and over again on the same medium, and you always get reasonably the same morphology. And these are all Bacillus subtilis. And not only are they Bacillus subtilis, they are greater than 99.8% identical at 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequence. That's much greater than the current cutoff for, for species inclusion for bacteria, which is about 97%. So it really got me thinking, what does it mean to be part of a bacterial species as we define it today? What is this all about? And what is Bacillus subtilis? And so 
that concludes sort of my general introduction. So I'm going to be talking to you about my sort of investigation of Bacillus cellulis at a genotypic level, sort of exploring more and more deeply what it means to be part of the species. What do we, when you go in higher resolution, what does the genomes look like? And then I want to, about the, roughly the thir last third of my talk, talk a bit about the phenotypic diversity that we see and sort of trying to translate some of the things that we're learning here to try to understand the molecular mechanism for why we see such diversity in their outward faces. All right, so a question I get a lot is why Bacillus subtilis? So I've shown you this amazing tree. There's so many organisms that I could choose. Why this one? Well, for the <laughs> a big reason is it's very well studied. Other than maybe E. coli, it's probably one of the best studied microorganisms out there. So we know a lot about the genetic uh, circuitry that leads to certain endpoints, certain biological outcomes. And in addition, it's genetically tractable, so we can manipulate it. And so if you're going to really try to get in and understand something new or novel, that perhaps you find in another strain or whatever, it's nice to have that good underpinning in which to work. Secondly, it's not a pathogen, so why do we care? So besides the fact I won't make myself sick, especially when I'm having those not quite adapted to the day mornings, um, it, more importantly for this study is that most of what we know to date about intraspecies diversity within a bacterium or bacterial group is focused almost exclusively on pathogens, or at least things that live at least part-time within some eukaryotic host. So I would argue that maybe our view of interspecies diversity is a little bit skewed. And so I thought it was important to do something that is not necessarily associated with a host. The other big reason is that we find it pretty much everywhere. And in addition, it's relatively easy to isolate. And so, so what I did when I first began this project uh, about four years ago, had a lot of good friends and colleagues who went out into the environment and brought samples back to me, and I isolated Bacillus cellulis from nearly every continent. Um, I'm still looking for some Antarctic soils, if you know anyone. So, professor here who goes up there every year. Actually, yeah. is it a woman? Yeah. I think I know who you're talking about, and I need to go hit her up. But so, so how do I actually isolate these guys? And so this is just sort of a brief um, sort of summary kind of, a, of how, how this takes place. So one, one way, one thing that I do is I take advantage of the fact that this bacterium makes a spore. So at certain times in its life, it goes and it basically goes into this quiescent state within a very hardy spore that's very resistant to heat. So I've already told you there's 10 billion organisms just within one gram of soil. So if I'm going to try to find Bacillus subtilis, I don't want to contend with everybody in there. So I can heat it up. Anything that's not a spore dies, and I just get spore formers. So that's a good sort of first pass selection for what I'm looking for. And I go through, do some colony purification, and then using a technique called multiplex PCR, where basically I design primers that uh, are specific for Bacillus subtilis 16S ribosomal RNA, but I also design primers that could bind to other templates, so other species. And so that way I can run a PCR, run a gel, look at, um, so is everyone fairly familiar with these sort of molecular techniques? Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm looking for uh, in a nutshell are, are sort of diagnostic banding patterns that would tell me that this is in fact Bacillus subtilis. But you might notice that species specific is in quotes. And that's because, as it turns out, 16S is not a particularly good marker for distinguishing Bacillus subtilis from its close relatives. It's funny, sometimes 16S works for a bacterial group and sometimes it doesn't. And so we know for other reasons that Bacillus subtilis is not within the same species as Phallus mortis or Moavensis or Amyloliquefaciens. But if you just trusted the 16S, you might imagine that it was. But that's fine. We can go and we can use another marker another gene that's also highly conserved, like 16S, but a little more genetically flexible, and then we get the higher resolution that we need to really start to pick apart this, who belongs to what. And so when we go to a gene like gyre and gyre encodes for um, a protein called gyrase, and so gyrase is important for s DNA supercoiling, and without that, you also die. So once again, it's, it's highly conserved, but a little bit genetically flexible. And what we see when we look at a uh, sequence like gyre A, is that unlike 16S, so my 16S was sort of a starting point diagnostic, I get a nice resolution where Valis mortis, this group here, 
groups out nicely, and then I end up with this large group here that we consider Bacillus subtilis, but it itself is divided up into two subspecies. So there's Bacillus subtilis by Zizinii, as it's been recently named, and Bacillus subtilis subtilis. Okay, great. So we've gone from 16S, we've gone to another conserved loci like gyre, and we're getting increased resolution in understanding sort of the population, how it's made up. We can learn things about its evolution in this, using this kind of uh, method. We can learn things about its migration. <coughs> Epidemiologists use this kind of uh, information all the time to track strains, et cetera. It's a very good way to, to, to look at a population of bacteria. But I would argue that if you really want to get to the heart of big questions in microbial ecology, understanding the evolution, speciation, what it's doing out there, who it's interacting with, you can't really rely on one gene within all of this genome, especially a gene that's highly conserved, and chances are the changes you're seeing aren't even functional ones, right? They're usually silent mutations. So naturally, what you want is you want to be able to look at all of the genes at once that are contributing to life for that organism in that particular environment. But while that's a great goal and that's a great thing to do and it would answer a lot of questions, with increasing resolution comes a lot more time and a lot more money. Now, things have changed a little bit since I started. <coughs> this is actually getting less and less, I'm happy to say. But uh, when I came along, there was no way that you, I could you know, hook up with a friend who just got a fancy new sequencer and say, here, let's see what we got. Which happens now, by the way. It's actually getting, it's getting to that point, which is kind of cool. But when I was doing this four, four and a half years ago, we had another method that we could use that sort of split the difference. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And it was a method called microarray-based comparative genomic hybridization. And so it allowed us to go well beyond nucleotide variation at conserved sites, looking a little bit more globally at gene conservation. Not quite a genome sequence, but it still gave us a great start. So comparative genomics using microarrays. All right, what is this all about? So first off, what is a DNA microarray? Um, perhaps some of you have heard of this, but the, I think it's, it's sort of, in a lot of people's mind, this really fancy thing. But the truth is, a microarray is nothing more than a glorified microscope slide that's been chemically treated so that you can take DNA that's been synthesized and spot it on there, and it sticks. That's what it is. And in this case, DNA that we're sticking to it are pieces that have been uh, synthesized. In my case, it was a company um, called Sigma Genesis. They had gone in and designed oligonucleotides that were specific for each one of the genes in the one sequenced representative of the species that we had. So there was one genome sequence when I started called 168, about 4,000 different genes. So when I contacted Sigma, they sent me a, about 11 plates of 384 wells, each one containing a different oligonucleotide for each one of the genes. I took these guys, went over actually to this building here to a robot, and I made a I programmed the robot to take the DNA here and spot them onto my slides. And that is the template from which I've done my experiments. So what is the experiment? So I'll say this for your just interest, is microarrays can be used for a number of different applications, transcription analysis, et cetera, but I used it to look at DNA content. And so the sort of overview of that experiment is here. So, so what I did, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward as well. I took the strain for which the microarray was built, so this 168 sequence strain, and I isolated its DNA. And then I labeled it with a fluorophore, this fluorescent molecule that when you excite it with a certain light at a certain wavelength, it emits another light, and we can see it as color. So you label that guy. In this case, let's say I labeled it with a red fluorophore. And then I took DNA from a completely, you know, say a strain from Namibia or so, isolated that DNA, don't know anything about it, labeled that with a different fluorophore, so I get a different color. And let's say in this case it's green. Took these two differentially labeled populations, mixed them up, put them on my microarray, went home, and the next day come back, I can wash it off. And what's happened overnight is that DNA present in either of these pools, if they have a piece of DNA in there that's homologous enough to recognize and bind to what's already on my, on my slide, it should stick, even after I wash it. And so that's the whole theory behind it. And so in the case of the control DNA, as you might imagine, it should stick to everything because that's what it was designed for. So in every single one of my spots should be red. <coughs> but in the case of the test strain, we don't know. But if it does stick, and in theory, in, when it sticks, we think, okay, maybe the gene is present, uh, you would get both a red 
red fluorescence from that, stri from that spot as well as a green fluorescence, and that of course makes yellow. So that's exactly what the data are. They're red and yellow spots in essence, and that's how we predict whether or not a particular gene within the test strain is either present or absent. So here's a bunch of data. Oh, this is, a, it doesn't matter. It's sort of a take home message slide anyway. So, so what you're looking at here um, is a whole lot of data sort of compiled into one big heat map. And all you really need to know to understand this is that each one of these columns represents a different test strain. And so they're sort of labeled at the top. And each one of these rows, there's 4,000 of them, so they're very tiny, um, represent different genes from 168. And the way I've ordered them is so that you start at the origin of replication, if you imagine a circular chromosome, and as you go down, it's as if you're going clockwise around the chromosome. So this is roughly the terminus. And the only other piece of information you really know to, to get what I need you to get out of this is that everywhere you see black is a gene that's presumably present in the test strain, and everywhere that you see blue is a gene that's presumably absent or significantly diverge so that it no longer binds, which is also a possibility. Okay, and if you're a good scientist, you, you do a control and make sure that it works, and I, tr I try to be a good scientist. And so uh, what I did was I took a strain that was from, uh, made from the, the control strain, and I deleted a 16-gene operon. And then I said, okay, will it show me that that 16-gene operon is absent in the absence of any other genes being absent, and sure enough it did. So I'm feeling, you know, there's a little bit of variation, but that's to be expected. And so I feel confident that the data is reasonably good. So I think you've already got the message, right? There appears to be a lot of genes in 168's genome that have some level of diversity in a number of these different strains. There's quite a lot, and I'll say this one big one, I'm sure it's catching everyone's eye, this is a big phage element. So it's a big phage that was integrated in the 168 genome. So it's a, like 100 plus genes that doesn't seem to be a present in a number of other strains, just so you know. And that does seem to be a bit of a theme that a lot of phage elements tend to come and go from these genomes. But another thing that I thought is kind of interesting, and I don't want to make too fine a point on it, is that if you look at the, you, there's a really high concordance between the relationship that you get when you look at nucleotide diversity at conserved sites and the amount of change that you see on the microarray. So maybe that's kind of intuitive. Maybe it probably <coughs> is. But I think it's kind of nice because in a, in, in a way, you can imagine that microarray-based comparative genomic hybridization could be a, a tool to use for phylogeny studies, but in addition, you get so much more information, right? Not only are you looking at conserved sites, you're also looking at genes that may or may not be contributing. That's sort of my pitch. All right, so before I go on, I just want to put this in the context of other bacterial species that have been looked at to date. So I'm certainly not the first one who's done this kind of analysis. And so what I've done here is I've taken a, taken a number of studies that have been performed on different bacterial species. And what I'm showing you is obviously the species name, the number of isolates that were looked at, and of course these were using array that were specific for one strain of staph, epidermidis in this case. And then in a pie form, and also written here, I'm showing you collectively how many genes, or the percentage of genes within that one strain that was queried that could be divergent within that population of strains. So out of 42 strains, it appeared that 36% of one strain of staph epidermidis could be variable. So the take home message for this slide is that there really doesn't seem to be a one size fits all kind of way for bacterial species to vary in terms of their gene content. And we don't understand why that is. We think it might have something to do with their habitats, where they actually live. And so if you think about Staph epidermidis and E. coli, we believe that these guys are pretty, they can live in a number of different environments. In these environments, they're probably seeing a lot of challenges, probably seeing a lot of different microorganisms. So maybe it makes sense that their genomes need to be more plastic to adapt to these different niches. Uh, in the case of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, this guy, its home is known. I mean, it is, it is completely relegated to the lung of the mammalian host. So maybe it makes sense. It doesn't need to be so plastic because it's not challenged with so many different things. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is kind of a weird one for us, and I add it here because we think of Pseudomonas aeruginosa as this sort of ubiquitous cosmopolitan organism that can live in a lot of places, but the genome data sort of if, if we're going to believe this sort of habitat theory, it sort of says something else. And 
it may or may not be true, but maybe it says that we need to rethink our current thoughts about the ecology of this particular bacterial species. Okay, Where, what about Bacillus subtilis? Where does it fit in? So not surprisingly, I think based on what you saw already in that heat map form, it sort of fits in better, well, clearly better, with the Staph epidermidis and E. coli bacterial species, which might suggest that it does, in fact, as we sort of thought already, live quite ubiquitously, probably sees a lot of different environments. All right, microarray comparative genomic hybridization is great. I, I think it's a step above a lot of different techniques, but it does have its limitations, one of which is I've touched on a few times, and that is you don't know at all when you see a divergent signal from a gene whether or not it's truly absent or if it's just you've got enough divergence. I should mention that in gyre, even though there's differences, it's always black, so you, it's, it never gives a divergent signal. And most housekeeping genes, no, all housekeeping genes, never give a divergent signal, just so you know. So even though you have a few changes. But anyway, so you don't know whether it's absent or divergent. The other thing is you're looking at this from the perspective of one strain. So there's no way at all of knowing whether or not these other strains that you're examining have novel DNA that isn't represented on that strain. In fact, case is, it probably does, but you don't know. And then, of course, there's the issue of genome rearrangements. Just because a gene is there, it doesn't mean it's in the same orientation, it's in the same gene island, et cetera, et cetera. So what does one do? Well, one sequences genomes, right? And I was very, very fortunate that when I started this project, within a year, I started a collaboration with some, a group at University of Maryland. We got together, we wrote a grant proposal with Rich and Roberto, and we got it funded to sequence more genomes of Bacillus subtilis and its close relatives. Now. This is a process. This was, we got the funding, I think, in 05. It's now 08, and we just really, in the beginning of this year, got our first two fully closed, fully sequenced uh, genomes. And so it's been a really a fun time for me in the past six months or so, going through and looking at all the different variations that we have. I don't have time to talk about too much today, and I still have a lot of analysis left to do, but I thought I'd just give you one sort of take home uh, picture of some of the analysis thus far. And so when we look at three different strains of within Bacillus subtilis, so we're not going to look at the other uh, close species yet, what we see when we just compare the gene contents, so we're just looking at the number of genes predicted within each one of these genomes, and we ask how do they overlap, what we see is something pretty striking, and that is that in each strain there are clearly strain-specific genes that are not found in any of the other strains. Now it's not to say that they're completely strain-specific, if we sequence 100 strains, that you know, possibility that that's going to go down. But the core, if you look at the total open reading frames encoded in all three, they only share about 61% of those. That's kind of interesting. So there's more to come here, but not today. <laughs> so I, I want to sort of conclude uh, my discussion of genotypic diversity for the species thus far and move on to what I've learned, what I'm trying to learn. It's been a little more challenging than I thought about phenotypic diversity and talking about these faces, these biofilms. So biofilms, yes? Yeah, when you see um, the diversity of, of the different bacteria, is it always the same genes that, that are in common, or is it? <sighs> right. You know, like, like the um, 16S, is there, are there a bunch of genes that are never in different species that always stay the same, and other ones that always it's a great question, and what I've tried to do to address that, because I only have limited information in, in terms of the number of strains for like the whole genome, so it's hard to make any kind of extrapolation from that. But what I've done is I've taken things like the gyre and the, the microarray-based comparative genomic hybridization data, and I've built trees to look at the relationship. And then I've tried to overlay morphologies and see if there's any pattern. So more closely related, do they look more similar? It's not, it's, it's not striking. It's not striking. It seems like these morphologies don't necessarily follow the, re the, the relationship trend. Unless they're, unless they're uh, uh, identical. So I have some strains that are, in theory, sisters or you know, brothers or however you want to call them. But you know, they were maybe derived from, you know, you get what I'm saying. Those tend to look the same. I mean, in terms of, um, you said that different species, like 40% of the genes differ. Is in B. subtilis, is it the same genes that differ as in, in tuberculosis as in 
is it the same oh. genes that are differing all the time? Okay, so and so is there like a common core of genes that just doesn't that defines different species. Oh, that's a great question, and I would say absolutely yes. There are cores of genes that probably do the job in defining the species because let's face it, uh, species had definitions before we had nucleotide data, right? And a lot of those have held firm, even in light of genome data. So it means that there's something about uh, carbon source utilization, nitrogen, whatever it's doing, respiring certain things that are part of the core of that species. And you're right, that's going to be in that sort of middle part of my graph. Um, answering the first question about if it's the same, same genes differing. So that's neat. So I can't say it's the exactly the same genes from bacterial species to bacterial species, but there does seem to be a trend and that genes having to do with the out, outer surface of the cell tend to be those that vary more. Um, certainly phage elements and things like that. Uh, let's see, genes having to do um, with sensing the environment tend to change. Genes having to do with detoxification, uh, antibiotic production. So there are trends in what you see coming in and out of a group of, of a particular bacterial species. Is there any other questions? Those are, that was great. Uh, so, biofilm, so maybe Rich gave you an introduction to biofilms already. No. So biofilms, um, it's been a pretty catchy phrase in the past 10 years or so. And they're actually very important, but they're also very, very common. Biofilms is nothing more than a, than a group of organisms living on a surface. And so, my God, that encompasses a lot. And every bacterial species, I think, that's been examined to date will form a biofilm under some condition. It seems to be a pretty common theme in all life cycles of all, all, all bacteria. And so if some, ba some biofilms are great, they're good for you. Uh, certainly they're used in biocontrol for certain plants. Some biofilms are really bad. Ear infections, you know, are, are infections that are due to catheter, you know, catheters, et cetera. Those tend to be attributed to biofilms. When a biofilm is part of what's causing your infection, it's a big problem because they're hard, for whatever reason, we have some ideas, they're really hard to treat with antibiotics, more so than, say, a, a, a swimming, shaking culture of bacteria. So they're very relevant, they're very important in the environment, and they're very important just in the physiology of the cells themselves. It's part of their life. And so we like to study them. And the way we study biofilms, especially for Bacillus subtilis, is really in two different formats. And so I'll introduce you to both, but I'm going to focus primarily on this one. So we look at them in the pellicle format. And pellicle is just a way of saying a biofilm growing at the liquid air interface. And we also look at them in a colony format. And in this way, we're not talking necessarily about the classical colony where you have one strain, one cell giving rise to many. Usually what we do is we'll actually spot a population of cells. And then over time, what happens on this particular medium is you grow, it grows up and you get these beautiful ridges and wrinkles and people call them spaghettis and worms and whatnot. And if, I mean, this is really quite thick. So if you turned it on the side, it's got a lot of architecture there. So it's really, I think, a very robust system to work with. What's yeah. the time frame to get one of those to roll it? So within 24 hours, you can see it moving out. So you don't really start to see wrinkles until about a little, about day two or so. This is probably a day three or four biofilm right here. And once it gets here, it might get a little bit more wrinkly, but it ten doesn't tend to move out any further than that. That's probably because nutrients have been all used up. So oh, I should mention, uh, we know quite a lot about biofilm formation, in particular, in particular for one strain called 3610, and that's been due, I think, largely by a lot of work that's been uh, done in Roberto Coulter's lab, so the lab the laboratory that I'm in, but also in Rich Losick's lab. And so uh, they really uh, pushed us on this, on this front. And so it appears that biofilm formation in 3610, and probably in lots of other bugs, really depends on a lifestyle switch, where the cells go from a modal lifestyle to one that's more sessile and encased in a, in a matrix. And so what happens is you start off with these cells that are swimming around. Eventually, they start to make these long chains of cells that start to bundle together. And we think that bundling probably has to do with the, the onset of an of a extracellular matrix being made that sort of sticks them together. 
And then eventually these bundles of cells come together and they begin to make these tongue-like projections that you see here. If you could get really close, you'd see there are little bitty cells all throughout here that eventually give rise to this guy here. And as you might imagine, the lifestyle switch is also very highly regulated. And so we know a little bit, and well, actually we know more than I'm going to show you, but about how this lifestyle switch is regulated. And it's actually gotten quite complicated, but we'll keep it pretty simple for today. And so it, one of the key players is this uh, repressor protein called SINAR. So SINAR literally sits at the promoter sites of different genes involved in biofilm formation and keeps them from being transcribed, so they're not being made. And in a way that we're just now getting uh, to understand, SINAR positively regulates motility. So when SINAR's around, you're not making a biofilm and you're swimming. The other big player is this protein called SINAI. And SINAI, as far as we know, its sole role in the cell is to antagonize SINAR uh, activity. So SINAI, when it's made, comes in, it can literally bind to SINAR and strip it away from promoter sites, thereby allowing biofilm, genes involved in biofilm formation to be turned on, and then motility stops. And SINAI, I think, is really sort of the toggle switch for this whole system. And it is the one that's subject to lots of different um, sort of messages from the outside of the cell. There are a lot of different intricate circuitry. So it's really the guy who decides when things start happening, when things start changing. And the major target for these two, this kind of core regulatory duo, are genes involved in making an extracellular matrix. And so extracellular matrix is the thing that comes outside of the cell and encases the cells and causes them to stick to each other and to things, other things. And we know a bit about the matrix players in this particular strain. There's two that we know of thus far. There's the exopolysaccharide, or EPS, and there's a protein component called TAS A. So when you knock out EPS production, so you mutate the gene, this is what you get. So you go from this very rugose morphology to a completely flat architecture. And instead of these nice bundles of cells, of chains, you get this disorganized arrangement here. When you knock out TASSE, you see a similar phenomenon. You go from, I'd say, arguably really quite flat, though there's still a little bit of feature, and once again, this sort of disorganized assemblage of chains. Oh, and this is to remind me to tell you that we know that these two different uh, uh, structural components do work outside of the cell because we can mix a cell that's mutant for EPS, but in theory is still making TASSE, and a TASSE mutant that's in theory still making EPS, and we can get this strain back. So they're working outside, and they can extracellularly complement each other. Oh, yeah. So these, like the EPS would be on, and, and when it turns off, then you're going to get the middle picture there. But once you form the, um, the biofilm there, can it go back to it? Okay, so, f um, so first off, somebody didn't do their phone check. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm usually the one who does that. Uh, so your question was, first off, when EPS is off, you make, okay, so that's, that's not quite right. So when EPS is on, you make this. So, okay, but then the question of going back, we've never seen this go back to this, but... Um, less so in this format, but when we look at the pellicle format, over time, it does seem to start to dissolve and the integrity gets less. We don't understand that. It could just be that everything is sporulated. I'm not really talking about sporulation today, but there are lots of spores at some point in this biofilm. But uh, it could be that everything sporulates and everything breaks down and it just falls down. Or, and this would be neat, if there's some regulated pathway that says, okay, we made the biofilm, there's no more food, let's bail. That would be kind of cool. So, but we don't know. All right, so back to the faces. So I've told you a, a bit about 3610 and what we know about the molecular mechanism behind why and how it makes its biofilm here. But what about these guys? Well, I think from, from my point of view, I was like, well, okay, I'll use the data that I get from my microarrays and I'll get from the genome data and I'll ask, okay, are the players there? Are they contributing like they do in 3610 to the success or to the formation of these different phases as a first start? And so we start with our EPS operon. So EPS uh, is encoded with a 16-gene operon. It makes a glucose-rich uh, polysaccharide. 
And all of my microarray data for my many, many strains suggested that all these genes are always there. And when I looked at the new genomes that we have, um, even at the amino acid level, they seem to be very highly conserved, which suggested that they're there, they're probably making the same kind of component. That might not be the answer, but it is formally possible that there's some redundancy in the system. It could be that other strains have another EPS operon that's turned on, and maybe that's why I'm getting these differences in the morphologies. So what happens when we knock this guy out in these other strains? So once again, to remind you what happens when we knock it out in 3610. And sure enough, when I knock out EPS and a number of other strains, I also see a lot of flattening. So it suggested to me that EPS is playing a role in these strains, and it's necessary to get these rugose morphologies. OK, great. What about TAS A? So TAS A is encoded in a three, well, it's uh, one gene, but it's in a three gene operon. And we know that each one of these genes is important for uh, the matrix. Once again, the microarray said they'd be there. The genomes told me that they would be there, and they'd be in high amino acid. I, they, probably the proteins are very, very similar. But when we knock this guy out, so once again, remind you about 3610, I would argue that the phenotypes that we saw for these guys, maybe except for this one at the end, were a bit less dramatic. So we were still getting quite a lot um, of sort of upward architecture. And so in, initially I was like, well, okay, well maybe, maybe there is some redundancy. Maybe some, some strains have more ta you know, protein components that are being put out, and maybe that's why I'm getting these differences. You know, it's, everything's just different because of the, what's being put outside. But it turns out that there could be another explanation and I think a more reasonable explanation, because my genome hunts haven't really yielded anything that screams another TAS A. And that is, when we look once again at wild type and the TAS A for 3610, when we take this strain and we make it produce a lot of EPS, so it's not making protein, but it's making a ton of EPS, this is what we see. So I would argue that this guy looks almost more like my wild, some, of, some of my wild strains than this guy ever has. So that got me thinking that perhaps it has something to do with the regulation, how much of maybe one or both of these components are being made in these strains that's different from this guy here. And this is just to say that it does not work in reverse, so EPS is absolutely necessary, at least for this guy. So what about the regulation? So I mentioned these two key components, SINAR, SINI. We knock out SINAR, and so we're back just looking at 3610 for now as a model. We knock out SINAR. SINAR is not around. You're never repressing matrix. So you're always making matrix. You're not swimming, so you get this really tight rugose colony. However, if you knock out SINI, you're never stripping SINAR away. You're never making matrix. You're always flat. Does this work in my strains? And are all of the matrix components under the, the regulation of these two? So let's, let's play the same game. So we knock out Sinar and this guy. We knock out Sinar and these other strains. And I, I would say that there is, in fact, a phenotype, that they do get a, more wrinkly. They don't appear to spread out quite as much. But from my perspective, I think the, the difference is much less dramatic in these guys than it is in this one, which might suggest that Sinar is perhaps not playing as major of a role for as long under these conditions as it is for this strain. So what about Sinai? Since Sinai is really the guy who regulates, let's make sure that everything is still going through this pathway. Because it could be that there's something else that's not under Sinai control, right? So if we knock out Sinai in 3610, we get our, our flat strain. And sure enough, when we knock out Sinai in this guy, all the strains go flat. So that's kind of cool. So it means even if there is redundancies in my system, it seems like they're all under this sort of core regulatory duo. So it's kind of interesting. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking that maybe there's something about when this guy gets activated that's affecting the timing of Sinar derepression. But remember, I already said that Sinai is subject to lots of regulation. We know that it's regulated both at the transcriptional level, so at the promoter when it gets actually transcribed. We know it's regulated at the, at the protein level, so even once the protein is made, there's some stability issues where sometimes it's more stable, and we think we know some of the players there. But it's very, very complicated. And when we started to think about this, and this doesn't show up too much, but that's okay, 
the bottom line is me, uh, myself and uh, two of my colleagues in the lab, one day we were like, God, because you get lost in all of these regulatory networks. We're like, all right, let's just go and we're just going to put everything we know up there. And this isn't even all that's there. <laughs> When you look at it like this, you're like, oh my god. And it turns out, all of this shaded region, which I don't know if you can see, could in theory feed into Sinai regulation. So it's a big can of worms. But the truth is, it's not all lost. I think that we have some clues as to what it may be based on some of the genome data. So I'm not, you know, it'll never be done. I think, I think we have some, some hints to go on. But I think it's kind of neat because what it sort of tells me is that it's probably when we look at these morphologies within these species, it's probably not novel genes, novel gene sequences that are being acquired that are really affecting the morphology. It's just the tweaking of things that are already there. And it makes me think about, you know, we as humans, I remember when the genome of humans came out and then they, the genomes of the chimpanzees come out, came out and, you know, and we looked at the differences and like 97% of the coding sequences were the same between the two and everybody's like, okay. But I think there's the story is very similar, isn't it? It's not necessarily that you need new genes to be different. You just need to tweak and regulate those genes in a different way. Yeah. So are you looking for like polymorphisms in some of these genes that might affect? Absolutely. So looking at promoter sites. So thing, you know, so we know promoter binding sites for certain regulators. You know, I've identified a few that don't appear to 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 they may not be binding the same regulators. So, the, you know, one change in a promoter sequence would then change when things are turned on. So we're looking at that. There's also some other interesting um, features. A lot of this has to do with this a phosphorelay where there's a signal from the outside that causes one protein to get phosphorylated, then another protein to get phosphorylated, and then another protein, and then that's a, the activator of this, and da, 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 da. And some of these phosphorelays are subject to these peptides that get sent to the outside, and when they come in, they keep things from, they sort of strip phosphates off. So I've found that in some strains, they don't have some of these peptides. So it could be that phosphorylation is happening quicker because they're not antagonizing it. So that could be part of it. There's, there's a number of things that we need to follow up on, but it's not quite as straightforward <laughs> as I had thought. So with that, I just want to summarize with a few quick statements. And that is, uh, I've shown you today that our initial analysis has showed that Bacillus subtilis as a species uh, showed that there was a lot of genome variation among strains within this group, in spite of the fact that they share nearly 100% identity at 16S. Preliminary analysis of the genomes um, showed that there's a number of species-specific genes that are present in these different strains. And, and even though it's early days, a lot of these, not a lot, but some of these are quite interesting because they suggest that they might encode for niche-specific processes that might be really interesting. And then finally, variation in biofilm, biofilm uh, formation is probably not due to new sequences, um, but rather differences in the regulation of conserved genes important for the process. And right now, I'm sort of, you know, pinning, you know, going for Sinai expression, thinking that it's probably both a temporal difference in when Sinai is activated, but also perhaps a spatial difference. And I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but that I think could also be part of it. And when I say spatial, I mean when things, oh, so Rich talked about stochasticity. So not all of the population is always turning things on at the same time. Did he show you biofilms? Did he show you slices where you could see? Right, so that could be part of it as well. So certain populations may not be turning on at the same time. Oh. Rich is my friend again. And with that, I want to thank you, obviously, for your attention and your great questions. And I also need to thank uh, Roberto Coulter, my mentor, as well as my lab, and especially those who work on Bacillus Sunilis with me. Naturally, Rich Losick and his group have been a fantastic partner in doing all of this work. And then I also want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators at the University of Maryland and, of course, the people who helped me pay my rent. So thank you very much for your time. Have you done any environmental changes between, you know, within a, the same species just to see, you know, are these genes turned on or off depending on environmental changes and will that change the matrix? Yes. So, so I haven't looked globally at expression differences when I change the environment, but I have looked at, so this medium that we use for biofilm, um, it's pretty minimal. It's got uh, uh, a glutamate and glycerol as sort of its carbon nitrogen sources. Uh, 
And I've sort of tinkered with that. Like, what if I put in a different uh, nitrogen source or one that's maybe l uh, the cell is less able to take up? Or, and you know, what if I put in a different carbon source? And what I see is that there are differences. You will see differences in the matrix. And in addition, certain strains behave differently. So certain strains are, they, they don't care. Certain strains do. So environment is huge, well, huge. Because you took them from all over the world, it made, makes me think that they had to adjust to wherever they are, whatever the niche is. So. Absolutely. And so I didn't know if that's with some of that turning on or off of the switches depends on. I think it does. I th and right now, I mean, we're, fo we're you know, it's, it's, it's challenging enough just in one medium, at, but you're right. I mean, I think the hints are there that it is something about different about how, what's tickling the proteins that are, you know, sort of setting off the cascade to get these things started. You're right. If, you know, if certain strains don't sense it and certain strains do, yes, that's got to be part of it for sure. And how the environment, how its ecology dictated that, I think is really interesting. Because I think that's a huge black box in microbiology today. Real, true, out, you know, in the world environmental ecology for microbes. Because we don't know a whole lot. And this is definitely a more general question, but you started out with showing the different classification schemes and going back in history. You know, we have to teach kids about classification, and um, I use that book. My textbook is from 2002, and it, it okay. mentions uh, the three domain system, the six yeah. kingdom system, and I mean, it seems to me that because of evolutionary considerations and we'll never totally be able to get DNA of things from the past, but I've also noticed that definitely a few times I've been here, there's definitely a bias at Harvard yeah. for its DNA, cut and dried, all classification, phylogeny comes down to DNA, and I'm just wondering, is that more of a bias here? Is that something that's more in microbial kind of studies, or is that definitely what we should be teaching the kids? So it's a great question, and I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I can't speak for sort of the macrobiologist. You know, I know that there is a strong group here who study the evolution of, of animals of all shapes and sizes. I would, I would love to hear their answer to your question. From my perspective, for microbes, as I mentioned before, really, I think DNA is where it's at, if you will, because it's difficult to type these strains, and it's not a perfect science um, in terms of you know what kind of things they're going to utilize. Although there are some hard and fast rules that seem to stick, no matter you know how many DNA samples you run for a particular group, they you know and how much variation, they always will utilize citrate, and they always stay together as a group. Cool, it's ironclad. But other than that, I think DNA is where it's at. But I would argue, and you can already see that it depends. On I think it could, always, as we go further and further looking at higher and higher resolution, we could probably start making little subgroups within subgroups within subgroups. I mean, you could imagine how you could get carried away. Is that useful? I mean, I think, personally, I think probably not. I think it's good to have a classification system that's reasonably agreed upon, that's reasonably rigid, and, and you do that because you need that. We need that. We need that structure. Medicine needs that structure. To think about these things, we need some structure. We can't have it changing every five, 10, 20 years. You know, it's not, it's not as useful, I think. So I don't know if I've, I haven't completely answered your question, but I would be interested to know what those guys think about it. I guess as a follow up to that, you mentioned in brief that the definition of species in the bacterial level is 97% of DNA. In common? Is that like the whole genome's common? Ah, uh, no, no, no. That that's 16S, and the so the other s rule to date, so that's one. So six, 16S, 97% or higher, and then in addition, um, I think this might be changing now, but they they have this way of doing DNA DNA hybridizations that you don't necessarily. It's not like what I showed you, where you're actually looking at which genes hybridize, but it's like in a test tube. I, I've never done this. Yes. The cod curves, so you could probably talk more about it, but the idea is you look at the re-annealing between two different templates, and they have, exactly, and they have to be 70% or higher. That's the cutoff right now. To be the same species? Yes. And how about strains? Is there a definition for strains, or how is that? 
subspecies. So yeah. subspecies, right. So subspecies is, so I, I'll tell you this. So the, the person who first identified the two subspecies of Bacillus subtilis, I've chatted with him a number of times, and he did it the same, you know, he looked at nucleotide variation at conserved sites, and he saw this robust sort of division, and he did his cot curves, and they were right around that 70%, and they decided to call it subspecies. If you talk to him now, he's like, ah, oh, we should have called it a different species. I don't know. You know, <laughs> once again, we can divide and divide and divide. I mean, I imagine I can show you, you know, I sequence 100 genomes and people would tell me, oh, we should, we should further subdivide them because, you know, some have this and some have this. And, but I think you, it, do, it gets less and less useful to do it that way. The truth is, what's, what should be taught to our students is that bacterial species, there's a, there's a lot of genome flexibility. That's surprising. We didn't know that. I didn't know that coming through school, you know. You thought of a, a bacterial species. It might have some differences, fine, some, but it was probably because of some, you know, mutational processes along the way and, you know, maybe as it's starting to evolve to become something else. But in general, you imagine it as this very homogeneous group. That's not it, you know. So Haemophilus influenza, is that the strain? It was for, I think that was the first genome sequence at a tiger in the mid-90s. Then a second one was done. And that's you know, when people started going like, wait a second. And then the three E. coli was done in early 2000. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, look at this. This is not at all what we expected. So that's neat. That's interesting. And that, I think, should be told to students because it, it's real. It's true. And I think it's really neat. When you uh, <coughs> showed those series of pie charts before, mm -hmm. and you showed like 35 percent B cellulose and 35 percent E. coli, something like that, two percent tuberculosis or TB. Yeah. What, what was that a measure of? of what variation was that? So that was looking at so similar to the microarray analysis that I had done. So they took one strain of say M. Tubercul tuberculosis and they spotted its genes, and then it queried a number of strains and just asked how many genes within that one strain varied. And so in that case, only about 2% among 20-something strains, only 2% of that strain's genes varied among that population. So that's what the measure was. That was the Why percentages. Do you the bonuses the 4%? Well, you know, it's, so it depends on who you talk to. One of the things that we think might be the case is that Pseudomonas aeruginosa may not really live in the environment like say something like Bacillus subtilis does, but maybe it is. So we think of Pseudomonas as uh, a big problem with CF patients, so we know it can colonize us and cause a big problem if you're immunocompromised, it ca you know, causes problems with burn infections, et cetera. But other than that, we don't really know that much about its ecology, where it's living outside. Like where do people with CF get Pseudomonas? It seems that it likes wet, warm places. But maybe the reason that the, so there's two th thoughts. Why is it so uh, similar? It could be that's a very new species. That's one thought. So it hasn't evolved long enough to acquire a lot of differences. And the other is that maybe like M, M tuberculosis, that it is, its niche is a little more well-defined. I don't know, I don't know, but it's, it's intriguing. Are there any more questions? You guys, you guys have been great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.